tinfoil hat. Oh, what the fuck are you guys even talking about? Global controls will have to be imposed, and a world governing body will be created to enforce them. Welcome to tinfoil hat. We, we, we go deep, homeboy. Eric, open your mind. Good morning, Swarm Man. Welcome to Tim Fall Hat. You know I am. You know I'm here to do. I'm here to. Rawr. Join me as always, Xavier Grill, and on the ones and twos, Jay Nice, Juicy Johnny, Johnny Woodard, everybody. Yeah, guys, uh, coming up this weekend, Indianapolis and St. Louis. Come see me live. Go to samtribly.com, grab those tickets. Eddie Bravo, Xavier Grill, myself, please buy tickets. If you're going to go, please buy tickets. Everybody's freaking out. Buy some tickets, please. Then Bellflower, Daddy's Dropping Hammers at the second anniversary of the Stand Up Club. Everyone's talking about how amazing this podcast is. And then Austin, Texas at the Vulcan Gas Company. Tim Fall Hat with Eddie Bravo, Xavier Grill, and myself. And then the follow, and then Sunday night, Dallas, Texas, House of Comedy with the same crew. Nothing. Bangers. bangers there we go grab that and again if you want to support the show as we've been telling you before uh go check go to click the link for the uh chaos twins comic book help us help you we'll just tell you a little bit more about that later on in the show let's get into it he is a uh personal favorite on my on this show favorite of all of ours uh every time he comes on he really crushed it last night with that. Johnny, what was that group you were in in high school where you guys were like all separated from everybody? Oh, AG, yeah. The, you know, yeah, he dropped some hammers on AG that. Is what we call it. Uh, and he's back with more. So let's get into it. Very excited to have him back. Please welcome Recluse Steven Snyder. How are you, brother? Doing well, sir. And uh, thank you so much for having me back on. Well, uh, I'm excited that Mark made it happen again. I always always enjoy conversations with you before we get into it can you for those who may not remember your last appearance can you tell us a little bit about yourself and where our listeners can find you and anything you want to plug uh well i am the longtime curator of the visa blog i uh, started a podcast known as the farm uh, which you can find usually in most google searches under the farm podcast mock 2 and i am also the author of three books most recently the art the secret of the psy war conspiratainment and the shattering of reality book one all right and uh, do you have a website well, yeah, usually it's just the Visip uh, website for my blog. Okay. Uh, it's V-I-S-U-P. You know, it's such a distinct name. You pretty much find that in any Google search. So, I will um, I will make sure to put that in the links below. So uh, what do you want to get into today? What do we want to discuss? I'm excited. Well, Mark told me you guys wanted me to give you guys a bit of a scary story here for Halloween. So... Fortunately, I've been working on something pretty creepy the last three years, and that would be uh, that whole the book I just mentioned. It's the first in a trilogy that I've uh, got coming out here. And the whole thing started as an exploration of QAnon and how conspiracy theories have been weaponized for the purposes of psychological warfare. Now, like a few years into this sucker, I pretty much realized I had stumbled upon a vast globe-spanning counterinsurgency program that was crafted during the Cold War on the one hand, uh -oh. and on the other, I was encountering a tradition that went back hundreds if not thousands of years and was effectively a magical working of the highest order. And <laughs> in trying to reconcile these two revelations, I just kept going back to Dave McGowan's premise in his classic program to kill book. And that's that serial killers were created by the security services for the purposes of terror, which on the surface, I mean, sounds really silly, right? But if you even take a precursory glance at how the U.S. wages counterinsurgency, puts McGowan's whole premise in a whole new light. The model for this was developed by a guy called Edward Lansdale when he fought a counterinsurgency in the Philippines right after the Second World War. 
Now, this guy used a lot of novel methods, including an early version of special operations forces. But the big thing everybody remembers is his approach to psychological warfare. So he had insurgents drained of blood. He had puncture wounds put in their necks. He had them hung from trees so what? it looked like they were killed by vampires. Oh. He he had uh, confessions given by insurgents recorded and then played from loudspeakers in the air after they had been killed so that the villagers would think that they were coming from ghosts and had all sea and eyes painted on the doors of suspected insurgents. And this tradition carried on with Viet into Vietnam on steroids. You had ghost voices blasted from helicopters as part of Operation Wandering Soul, which a young officer named Michael Aquino cut his teeth in. And then elsewhere, you had some really interesting stuff done with those legendary death cards, like mutilating an insurgent skull where the pituitary gland is located, and then nailing a card there with a green skull dripping blood. Oh, my so, God. Oh. In, this, in this context, the possibility that the security services were using serial killers really doesn't seem that far out, right? It doesn't, dude. It doesn't at all. And I think you're really on to something. Uh, you know, again, I get into this thing where, like, how much of the pain and suffering and violence and war and war crimes would actually be happening if you didn't have this hidden hand of this predator class manipulating things from behind the scenes in a, in a way of just moving and terrorizing people to get our anxieties up, our fear up. And because when our anxiety is high, our fear is high. We're probably depressed as well because we're so scared and we're easily manipulated at that point. And that's my humble opinion. Well, it gets even weirder than just the fear and anxiety oh, because God. you start looking into this stuff, you got to end up going to Artichoke and MK Ultra. And when you start looking closely enough at those programs with the psychedelic drugs, the early experiments with ESP and all the personnel involved in those UFO investigations, you're left with a really unsettling prospect. And that's that all of this wasn't just a psychological operation. And that at a minimum, some of these spooks and military men started to genuinely believe that they were communicating with something that was not human. And from there, you start asking things like, is possession real? Oh, man. And is that something that's been weaponized? Now we start getting some uh, some uh, religious stuff and like fallen angels and Nephilim and all that stuff. We've had a lot of people coming on that they think a lot of possession involves the, the spirits of the Nephilim who couldn't die. I mean, I'm, I'm into all this stuff, like how crazy it is. And that's why I always say, man, it's like the world's way more interesting than you think. And like, I honestly believe that the world as we know it right now, or as we don't know it, and what's really going on is like every movie ever all at the same time. That's my opinion. Well, I think well, it makes sense because I think those movies are, you know, drawn from reality. Yeah, know? 100%. Course, yeah, I buy that. I think it was like actually The Shining specifically that's been uh, transformed into Twin Peaks season three, where we're sort of like uh, either Jack or Cooper trapped in an endless time loop in the Black Lodge. Yeah, I buy that. Yeah, Have you, you you should really watch Twin Peaks, Sam. Uh, I think you would enjoy it. It's rewarding. Watch it with your kids, sure. Until you get to the, well, don't watch it with your oh. children. But. Well, my kids yeah, are yeah, three. Say, I'm gonna watch at a certain age. I'm gonna watch Twin Peaks with three year olds. Yeah, yeah. Just make sure they're looking at you and not the TV. And I. Think oh, okay. okay. So have them watch me as I watch Twin <laughs> yeah, Peaks. Yeah, yeah. That's some weird. Good luck corralling three year olds. It, it, but he's he's right. It, it's there's so much to it, that it, David Lynch has to say about the world we live in and and can, you know as it evolves. Like the the lat twi season three was just. I mean, I, I don't even know what to say about Twin Peaks Season 3, Reckless. It was unlike anything I've ever seen. Well, what really. do you think is more accurate, Twin Peaks or um, or or Black Mirror? I'm not sure accurate is the word. What do you think is more... I mean, Black Mirror is all about predicting technology and its influence on the future. And that I think that David Lynch has more of an esoteric approach to you know those types of things. Yeah. All right. I'm, all, I'm into it. I'm open-minded. I think it's crazy. I think it's, I mean, yeah, I, I this is, I, I always wonder, like, there's such, so many, and I don't want to jump all over because I know you have a presentation, but, you know, when you hear someone like, um, 
Who's the gay serial killer? What's his name? Um, Ted Bundy. Dahmer. Dahmer, Dahmer, right? Dahmer. You know, like when he was a kid, he called the president. Like he called the White House and got through. And you're like, that's really weird to me. It's probably where he got all his ideas from. He was like, oh yeah. Are you talking well, to killer gays? Yeah. I mean, some of it could be even weirder. I mean, one of the things I've been trying to confirm, but I think Dahmer was actually baptized on the day that uh, Gacy was executed, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, really? Well, that's, yeah, that yeah. is completely weird, like souls going into different Yeah, places. yeah. yeah. I, mean, well, I mean, like... When Dahmer was kind of active in that, um, you know, the gay scene around Chicago, too, um, during the 80s. So there's also this sort of slim chance that they might have met each other at some point. But, I mean, it's all in that because wow. Dahmer was act operating out of Milwaukee, which is only about two hours from Chicago or something like that. So it's a very close uh, neighborhood there. Yeah, and for then sure. Oh, uh, but yeah. um, it is crazy, uh, dude. It's just. And like how many how many of these serial killers went to Vietnam, got sprayed with Agent Orange, and came back just fucking twisted? I mean, it's you nuts. Think, you think the government knows that that could be a side effect? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. of you becoming a serial killer? Like, like how many episodes have you well, been on this show? Yeah, no, no, no. But well, no, no, honestly, no. how many? Like five no, hundred? No, no. no, I get that. No, no, but that Agent Orange. That one of the side effects is that if you take too much of it, you might come back here and become a serial killer. Like you really, they they have it that pinpoint down. Like I know they can do that. I mean, but dude, I'm just saying. Like, is it there? Like, I don't know if I. I mean, like, when you're watching commercials, they're like could cause su suicidal thoughts. Yeah. Why couldn't they have something that causes homicidal, homicidal thoughts? thoughts. Yeah. That's just yeah. That to me just blows my mind. The how they do. By the way, goal. I told you. I, I for some I was having. Uh, Oh, for some reason, I got prescribed uh, off or off something off label. I can't remember what it was now. It was, it was when I was in college. Uh, I got prescribed this medication that is also an, uh, uh, you know, an antidepressive sort of agent. Yeah. And I went in after a week of taking it, and I just told the doctor, I was like, "Yeah, I, you know, I, it's okay, but I just feel like, uh, I don't know, I feel like my my knees are kind of itching, and I just kind of want to jump out of my skin." And this black woman, who was my doctor, turned white and just kind of looked at me. And she goes, "Stop taking that immediately." I was like, "What?" She's kind of scared me. I was like, "What are you? What are you talking about?" She goes, "That's that's this that's the thing where people start killing their families like right after that." So just don't just that's what dude. That's what Whoa. the doctor told me. Isn't what? Yeah, like so. I I was. It's there's some well known side effect of one of these popular their uh, knees start itching well it's it's this feeling <laughs> of your skin crawling kind of and and kind of uh like a joint like a restless legs kind of like that thing and then that's a, a now just a, go through this like and that's on the market that just no yeah she knew this yeah i mean like unless that email just dropped in her lap like just right now they're like, hey, listen, if anybody has itchy knees and want to jump out of their skin, <laughs> they could want to kill their family. Like, it's not, like, that's an option. The only thing I'm thinking is that maybe something she had seen before or something like that, uh, that it was especially, you know. Yeah, but the point is, her. it's like, if that's on the table. Right, oh. and that and that drug is still on the market. I mean, and how close is this? What is it called, Johnny Prep? Oh, no, no, no. Is I'm it saying, Prep? I mean, at that time, it's on. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously. <laughs> no, but, uh. I mean, how close is suicidal to homicidal? I, not far I mean, off. I think that's I, what I mean. Yeah, it's not that far yeah, off. I, I think it's this. This is the difference. Here, here. That's it. Yeah, 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 that yeah. far it's away. It's the direction you point the gun. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's it. it. Really, one hundred percent. Okay, maybe I don't want. Oh, okay, go ahead. No, go on. Sorry. Oh no, I was just gonna say. Well, maybe it plays into whether uh, the side of one of the additional side effects is related to erectile dysfunction or something like that. Yeah, as well. for sure. Like, <laughs> I mean, that could be like the deciding factor. I mean, if you can't even get hard anymore after you're taking <laughs> yeah, the thing, instead of just out. committing suicide, maybe you now need to lash <laughs> out at somebody. Who knows? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take out your competition. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. If Viagra doesn't work on me, I might want to shoot someone. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm three <laughs> pills in. I'm three pills in. Yeah, nah, you, I might you should get mad. take the Rhino 55,000. You could be <laughs> paralyzed and your legs will get stiff from the Rhino 55,000. All right, I don't want to get off track. Where do you want? So where? Well, let's pick up where we kind of left off. What do you want to talk about here? So, um, I I have some notes where like uh. Where where do you want to start? I feel like we we went off the rails and we've uh, haven't allowed you to cook with gas. 
Oh, you're fine, man. I mean, anytime we start talking about uh, antidepressants and erectile dysfunction, I'm good. But um, <laughs> let's get back to uh, something I mentioned the last time I was on here, and that was the whole seance that changed the world, because that's a really groovy one, right? All right. So there were actually two of these things, and one happened in 1952 on New Year's Eve, and the second one was on June 27th, 1953. So they were also kind of unfolding right there around uh, the solstices and so forth. And supposedly at these seances, initially there were, I think, three people at the first one and then nine people at the second one. They were done by a doctor named Vinoid. Uh, the participants were supposedly contacted by entities that were subsequently known as the Nine, who were either transdimensional aliens or beings that existed in pure consciousness yeah. within a computer. Depending upon, you know, who's telling the story, it changed a little bit over the years. Also, they claim to have been the Grand Anid from ancient Egypt. Uh, as back in the day, they were worshipped by gods and humanity and all this other good stuff, right? So... These things would continue to show up time again in pop culture. They turn up in the JFK assassination. They turn what? up in Watergate. Yeah, they just keep coming. And it always begs a lot of interesting questions about this. So the people who were involved in the second seance were a bunch of New England blue buds. You had people like the DuPonts, the Astors, the Paines, and so forth. And... I'd always kind of dismissed this, um, you know, for a lot of years. But after going to some of these really crazy mansions that these families like the DuPonts have put up and seen, you know, frankly, what is the really ritualistic setup that they've got in a lot of them. Jeez. I've uh, I've had to wonder if it was just a coincidence that many of them were there. Uh, but anyway, the big guy doing this was a dude named Andrea Puharic. Who was a doctor and um he had a lot of different channelers for this stuff over the years as the transmissions from the nine kept coming uh one of them was a fellow named yuri geller who a lot of people probably heard of he's an yeah. israeli stage magician also a asset at times for Mossad, for mi6 is this the guy you were talking he's about he's a bullshit artist he's a he's the guy who the guy who like whispered stuff to maria bon Bronovich. is that the guy no 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 he he's he remember he used to spoons, come on tv man. in the 80s and bend spoons all the time he would do all these that like guy right there right he used to be wildly popular uri geller yeah him right yeah, he got exposed yep. by James Randi on uh, multiple occasions. Um, How did, why? What did he say well, he was doing? He was bending spoons on like Carson and James, uh, Carson had James Randi on to to give. He's like, okay, now use my spoons and do it, and he couldn't do it. You know? <laughs> why? What was up with his spoons? Well, he does. I mean, there are all a million ways to bend spoons. Sometimes you have pre weakened spoons. Sometimes you can do sleight of hand where you just press them quickly against a table or something while you're lifting it. You know, to the you know the person's eye. And, and and then you just hold it between your your index finger and your thumb. And then Mossad sent this guy over. Like, are they just effing with us at this point? Let's just send out the guy that bend, who bends spoons, and people will love him. <laughs> and then he'll infiltrate the highest levels of but Hollywood. I mean, he's been he's he's just a he's a hokum artist. I mean, he's a bullshit artist, totally. Uh, I mean, he's probably may, may not even be the most colorful figure they had channeling these things. I mean, another one was this dude called George Hunt Williamson who was a contemporary of uh, George Adam Ninsky, and he also uh, worked with uh, William Dudley Pele for a lot of years. Uh, he was the founder of the Silver Shirts, a World War II era fascist organization. Uh, George Hunt Williamson had a really colorful career. He ended up becoming a member of the uh, Sovereign Order of St. John. He started the, what was it, the Church of Seven Rays in Latin America, what? which has subsequently been taken up by the I Am movement. Uh, yeah. Freaking crazy, dude. Okay, you brought up I Am Movement last time. What is the I Am Movement? Well, it was started by this couple called the Ballards uh, around the late 1920s, but um, we've uh, looked at some evidence of this. It might have actually a lot of the ideology been taken from the aforementioned William Dudley Paley. Uh, Paley was a guy who claimed to have had essentially an outer body experience, uh, which he wrote down an account of at Seven Minutes of Eternity, uh, which became quite popular around the late 1920s. And he started bringing all this theosophical stuff and what have you, even early accounts of the serious tradition into his cosmology. And then in 1933, he believed that I believe the second coming of Christ had occurred on earth and it had taken the form of Adolf Hitler. 
What? Oh. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And um, this had led him to create the paramilitary silver shirts. It was around this time that he started meeting up with the Ballards. And it actually looks like that um, Mrs. Ballard was having an affair with Paley. Uh, they ended up taking over a lot of his militia types after he was uh, brought up on sedition charges and what have you, too. But um, wonderful guy. Hold I mean, on. Had- hold on. There's so much you just said so much. So this guy thought Jesus was born again, and Jesus came back as Hitler? Effectively, or I can't remember if that or like the Maitreya or something, but yeah, some sort of divine being had come back to Earth and taken on the earthly manifestation of Adolf Hitler. So crazy. I mean, you could pick anybody. as Like, (laughs) how do you get anyone to follow you after that? Like, that has to be the last fact you tell them. I mean, you do hear these people people following him, Matt. You do hear people I who mean, were in the presence of Hitler describe him as having like you. There, this is a report from all the generals who are trying to excuse their actions. Let's, I mean, let's be upfront about it. But they say when you were in a room with him, like you went in there, like I'm gonna quit. I can't take take this shit anymore. Uh, and he just had this like hypnotizing, mesmeric effect. His eyes, you know, like he had these just this glare that could influence people to do whatever, you know, and some people ascribe the supernatural to that, his ability to influence people. So. Do you think the, he had any connections, Hitler, to the Rothschilds at all, Stephen? That's a good question. I mean, I don't know if he necessarily had a connection to the Rothschilds, but there was just this whole... See, I mean, a lot of people don't talk about this, but the Nazis had actually started relocating a lot of Jews to the Holy Land uh, before the Holocaust really kicked into high gear. In fact, that was actually sort of um, one of the things that contributed to the foundation of the modern state of Israel in the aftermath of the war. But I've always wondered uh, if there was part of the reason why several Jewish elites had financially supported Hitler at some point, because it kind of seems like at the early days, um, I guess, sort of like the what the know nothing party of the United States, they like, you know, over here, we wanted to just send the African-Americans back to Africa. Well, Hitler was supposedly just content with helping the Jews return to the Holy Land in the early years before the, you know, all the gas chamber stuff. Oh, man. Okay, now you're now you're getting deep on some stuff. And this is like this is the thing when people start talking about it. You know, people get really weirded out, and this is another dangerous conversation on the show that that Hitler actually wanted to get them to Israel. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was uh, one of the original plans that they had looked at. I mean, it was, you know, again, one of many, but they did actually help Jews relocate to the Holy Land at some point in the early days before the uh, the whole final solution thing really gained a lot of traction. There's just a lot about Hitler that just you go, okay, what is going on here? Like, that's a fact that's very interesting. And then, like, why didn't he ever attack Switzerland? That's an interesting, like, hey, dude, why, why, why aren't you going to Switzerland? You're, you're steamrolling all of Europe. But you're not going to go to Switzerland? It's, like, weird to me. And then, and then he also didn't want, like, the German people to know that he was killing the Jews. That's why they were outside of Germany. He had them in, like, Poland and, like, the concentration camps. Like, the work camps were in Germany, but the killing them was not in Germany. They, he didn't want the people of Germany knowing, hey, we're fucking killers and we're just gassing people. I know there are theories that they wanted kind of a place to go hide, you know, if, if they lost the war. But oh, really? I can't believe that. Because I don't think they ever thought about losing any of those guys until much later. Uh, They never thought they were going to lose. But think about this, honestly. If your your country didn't cover the war, like... Didn't cover it? What do you mean? Didn't cover Let's say Latin America. How into World War II? What do you mean? Like news coverage? Yeah. Okay. Like, oh, it's World War II, but who who in Latin America is involved with that? I don't know. So it's like, you know, now you got this guy, Hitler, everyone says he's in Argentina. Like, what does that mean to the average Argentinian who may not have had television or any kind of uh, connection to what was going on in Europe? Yeah, most most were neutral and supported the allies with material, but uh, Mexico and Brazil sent some troops to fight in the war, but that's about it. That's about it. Like, it's kind of crazy, right? Like... You know, I mean, I'm just saying, like, it's 
it's just super Hitler is super like we it's like like it's such a weird thing with Oh, that. there's so much about Hitler that's that's just it just feels like they're missing pieces uh, to that story, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. And the way Johnny talks about how like people would go in there trying to quit and he'd convince you that sounds like some Lucifer like Lucifer stuff like yeah, where he Luciferian. Yeah, like where he had like some power he like possessed or some demon in him. They say that. I mean, they really do say he was so influential one on you know, you've seen him as a speaker and you're like, "Oh, okay. That's something." But apparently but he had the like same But that's like cult leaders, one -on -one. right? Yeah. Yeah. They're they have a sort of magnetic effect. And it's just like and then you get into birthdays and like what that birthday represents and and then you get into the numerology of it. It's it's so crazy. It's just so crazy. And, and like I want to get back to the nine because I find it very interesting. You know, uh, we've talked a lot about pagan gods on the last episode. I just, I, I, I just like, I. Uh, what are your thoughts? Like, uh, are do you have? Are you an atheist? Me? No, no. What are you? Uh, I would say I would. I don't know, probably an agnostic. I don't really have a specific designation. I just sort of have uh, my own personal beliefs, I guess, based on my experiences in life. Does fallen angels register with you at all? Yeah, yeah. I definitely think to some extent that's plausible. I, I think there's a lot of credence to the Book of Enoch and that kind of thing, certainly. I find it interesting, but all these, like when when I see here it says, the, you know, humanity as gods of ancient Egypt, I'm like, are those gods or are those fallen angels, right? It's like, it's Is so, it a, even a relevant distinction? You know what I mean? Does it matter? Does it? Uh, I, uh, does it? Hey, guys, real quick. I don't know if you noticed this, but the crypto market is starting to jump again. Ooh. Okay? Things are popping. And that's why I want to tell you about our friends, James McMahon and Copy My Crypto. Let me tell you about Copy My Crypto. Guys, listen. We've seen so many people making ridiculous money from crypto. But did you know you could do the same? The Copy My Crypto membership site shows you the coins that YouTuber James McMahon personally holds and allows you to copy them. It's like having a big brother who knows what he's doing. You don't need to know a thing about crypto or how to invest as you simply do what he does. So let me tell you more about James. He runs Crypto with James YouTube channel, which despite heavy censorship has over 26,000 subscribers. Since March 2020, he told his viewers to buy 26 crypto coins. Had you put $100 in each of those coins, it went up to be worth $123,000. Of the 26 coins, his top pick of the year, a coin called Phantom, went up 692 times from when he said. That one call alone retired a number of people, including guys in their 20s and 30s. Remember, this is public knowledge. You can go to YouTube and verify this yourself. So if you'd like to join the 2,800, 2,800 members who copy James, then stop what you're doing and head right over to copymycrypto.com slash TFH. That's copymycrypto.com dot com forward slash tfh that's t f h you'll not only find proof of everything i said but my listeners get full access for just a dollar once again that's copy my crypto dot com slash tfh the recession is here guys you can suffer like everyone else or choose to thrive james is the real deal go visit the site now all right, so we have this this uh, seance, and all this weird shit pops off. And then these people they talk to are the nine. Uh, and what do the nine basically? What what were some? Uh, well, well, you gave us a list of people who were involved, but what happens in this seance? Well, they essentially were told that they had a great destiny where they would uh, go forth and guide humanity, or something to that effect. And this led to some pretty crazy stuff. I mean, it seems like from beginning around the early 60s, they started to incorporate a lot of this into uh, various uh, forms of entertainment. And the really big thing seems to have been the circle around Leslie Stevens, who created The Outer Limits. His uh, father was an admiral in the Navy. 
And this is where Gene Roddenberry was work was uh, lurking around before he started Star Trek, right? And Star Trek is just absolutely littered with all of these mythos of the nine in it. I mean, obviously, you can see this was like DS9 and some of the later ones. But I mean, almost from the beginning, Roddenberry was putting stuff like that into there. That's but for crazy. me, it's really interesting and what i just kind of uncovered is the fact that stanley kubrick was probably also embedding this stuff into pop culture and specifically with 2001 one of kubrick's really good friends a guy he went to high school with and who got him into direction would go on to work extensively on the star trek franchise and he was working with leslie stevens all the way back in 1960 and when you look at how kubrick basically has these disembodied intelligences in 2001 i think that this is very much taken out of the nine mythos that they were trying to seed as long as as well as the connections to psychedelics which were always closely connected to the nine from the beginning with um Puharic effectively claiming at one point that they had guided him to discover some magic mushrooms in maine i think around like 1955 or something like that uh, in a lot of ways, I mean, 2001 is almost like the ultimate personification of this whole milieu that uh, this mythos had spawned. That's so crazy. I mean, like, there's definitely some Star Wars, Star Trek. They have all this weird stuff. Like, I, when I watch Star Trek, I mean, Star Wars, all the new ones, I go, this is DEI, you know, at its greatest. Diversity, this is the most... This is where diversity goes. The cantina in Star Wars where everyone's got a gun and there's one of everyone. That's where it's like it's I wouldn't doubt that these these sci-fi shows actually have some dark arts symbolism behind them. And like like do you have any examples of where there's some nine in Star Trek that that really interests me? Do you have any examples of that? Well, yeah, I mean, you could see the Q character, for instance, uh, is being sort of based on that whole thing. My favorite. He, based was, yeah, exists outside of time and space. In the case of DS9, I mean, it's really blatant with, uh, what is it, the prophets, I think they're called, those um, interdimensional beings that live in the wormhole um, outside of the planet there that the spaceship is hovering around. Gosh, I can't remember the name of it now. But there's a really telling scene, I think, specifically in like the oh, like end of, I think, this, I think it's the season finale for the fifth season. But it's the time when they brought Cisco into the wormhole and he's communicating with these beings, right? The prophets, right? And yeah, the prophets. And I mean, he basically says something to them. If you want people to believe that you're gods, then be gods, because they're about to be invaded um, by that oh, that really advanced civilization from uh, the Delta Quadrant or something like that. And um, essentially, the prophets just make this whole armada disappear, you know, like that, like it's nothing to them. So I think that that's yeah. You also interesting. see in the Final Frontier, Star Trek Five. Uh, you know, there's this being that is fit, pretending to be God at the uh, center of the universe. Uh, and he, you know, it, it kind of, uh, I would say would represent maybe one of these beings uh, like a false angel of light or whatever. But his whole yeah. thing is he's drawing the, the crew of the Enterprise to the center of the universe. And then they get there uh, and Spock's brother has kind of hijacked, it's a convoluted sort of story, but they he hijacks them and like takes them to this. And then... He's like, come closer, bring your ship closer. And then Kirk's in the back. He's like, uh, excuse me, <laughs> what does God need with a starship? And then he just starts shooting laser beams out of his eyes at them, you know, trying to kill them all. But it's, it's, yeah, I could totally see how you could see that as a, you know, the, the subtext there is that there are these, these maybe fallen angels that are parading as beings of light and possibly hiding in space, you know, like using space as their cloak, uh, you know, and and really it's not space, but, you know, maybe extra dimensional uh, territory out there that is, uh, you know, they're trying to draw us into it so that they can somehow take something from us that they need. That's why maybe we're being pulled to the cosmos. Uh, who knows? It's interesting, dude, and it's weird. It's just well, I mean, really... really I mean, most of the earliest spiritual traditions are effectively centered around the whole concept of, uh, you know, what we refer to in the synchro mystical community as astrognosis. Because, I mean, really, when you get back 
to the traditions uh, really from Egypt, from Babylon, especially involving theurgy, the uh, transmutation of the consciousness. You know, all of this is essentially about traveling through space. I mean, a lot of ancient traditions believed that the human soul originated in the Milky Way. And then it, uh, in the process of incarnation, traveled down through the planetary and celestial spheres. And then upon death, he returned to the stars. So, I mean, this has always been something that's fascinated uh, humanity. And specifically, there's always been this question, I think, that, you know, we've been uh, struggling with almost throughout our existence as to whether or not this is an actual physical space out there or is this something much more metaphysical uh, because it has always been very closely tied to this religious journey right so that's where it gets even more incredible i it's mean in a lot of ways so you know we're just kind of discovering the earliest faith now it's just so crazy dude it's so it's constantly a mind game and the purpose of it, I don't know. I think it's to keep you confused. Yeah, yeah well, congratulations. You did. <laughs> I am shish kebabbed at this point. So what do you think became of the nine? Well, they still seem to be lingering around. I mean, they had uh, actually a residency at Esalen for a couple of years. They were promoted by Jenny O'Connor, who was one of the Chandlers uh, for a time. Interesting, too, there was another one in the 70s known only to posterity as Bobby, who was a cook from Daytona Beach, which has always fascinated me because I'm a cook from Daytona Beach. So <laughs> anyway, Hold on. What are, you becoming... what are you saying? That a cook from Daytona Beach might have been part of the nine? He was one of the Chandlers at the Nine. For oh, whatever reason, man. he was one of the vessels that they used. So, yeah, they used Uri Geller. They used the astro-fascist George Hunt Williamson. They used the New Age flag Jenny O'Connor. And they used the cook from Daytona Beach. <laughs> what so did funny. you call him? The astro-fascist? Yeah, yeah, George Hunt Williamson. Why, why is he an astro-fascist? By the way, best name ever. I mean, yeah, if we anybody thought that would be let's, Hitler. Let's be he was an early <laughs> ufologist. Like I said, he was there with uh, George Adaminsky when that, you know, blonde Aryan being from Venus stepped out of the spaceship, right? What? Uh, I mean, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. He later, you know, worked for George, William Dudley Paley. The guy was just telling you about the silver shirt Fuhrer. So, I mean, what else are you going to call him? He's an astro-fascist, right? <sighs> I've never heard of astrofascist. I just came up with that in the spot too, man. Oh, you made that up? Yeah, just right now. Oh, I like snap. I like it. I nice. do like that. Astrofascism. Now we got another now we now we got fascist aliens here. <laughs> Swimming around with Hitler mustaches, probing Dude, you butts. Would be you would be amazed when you go into these channel communications how often some supposed superior uh, intelligence from another uh, galaxy has traveled all this way to Earth to inform us that, in fact, the Jews all are the ultimate personification of pure evil in the known universe. I <laughs> what? Imagine trying to... What, bro? What? Yeah, I... Who is coming that far? Imagine traveling that far. And everyone's like, whatever anti-Semitic being from another... Well, yeah, imagine your excitement at meeting. Okay, the, the spaceship door opens, you know, and you're like, oh my God, what? Uh, greetings, you know, lovely to meet you. What What can you tell us about the nature of reality or, you know, the, the, the life in the universe? And they're like, the Jews, man, the Jews. You really <laughs> got to watch out for the Jews, bro. And then they just leave. Keep oh, your yeah, eye no. on the Jews, yeah. man. Oh, no, no. First, they give us the one advice. Like, you have a great and shining destiny before you. But first, <laughs> just have to do a little work on your racial hygiene. <laughs> racial hygiene. <laughs> oh. oh, my oh, God. Man. Isn't that hilarious? I'm not saying he was right about We're everything, but Hitler had some ideas. You know, that's that's the, the alien. Yeah, this guy, this guy's from another higher and a higher dimension where all is love and all is pure, and they only speak the truth. What do you say? Hitler had some good ideas. Okay, wrap it up. Call the day. Cancel. There we go. Cancel. And, and we're off to commercial. We'll be right back. <laughs> Crazy dude. Crazy. We need to get a Chandler on this show. I would love that. Just channel some shit. I would love that. And we'll be like, ask the entity when XG's English is going to get better. 
Come on, I got, we we got babble. I've been I've been trying. <laughs> He's the only He's one who gets babble to learn to speak English. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is that even an option? <laughs> I think I think that would be the best. <laughs> oh, hey man, learn to, Do you want to learn to speak English? If you already know how to speak English, learn how to speak better English. Oh man, that is crazy, dude. So we got the nine. The nine now has some Daytona Beach Chandler. That's so crazy. That's so crazy, dude. Right? And they've got I mean, us. If you could pick anywhere, would you pick Daytona Beach? You're the worst places. Oh. I mean, not for Chandler. I mean, of anywhere. Yeah, that's a good point. But yeah, I mean, trust I, me, Daytona Beach is not the place you're going to find somebody who's especially spiritually enlightened. I lived there for nearly 20 years. I oh, know, really? man. I know. Yeah, it's yeah. also not the place you would expect uh, beings to come through. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, where are we going to appear? How about the guy in Daytona? Well, you know Beach? my theory about this dimension, right? That all these entities treat it like Tijuana. Yeah. They Which, come here for a donkey show. So if you're going to come here for a donkey show, just think about it. It actually does make sense to me, right? When you're going to play like Grand Theft Auto, right? Don't you pick the weirdest character? Like you had like the weirdest dimensions, the weirdest haircuts, the weirdest stuff. And so if I'm an entity, entity yeah, that's and why you go to Florida. Right? Yeah, yeah, you so would. you're like, dude, where can I get the weirdest avatar to work through? Well, we got this. Cook in Daytona Beach who's got frosted tips <laughs> yeah. and barbed bar wire tattoos. Tim or Peggy who does the ping pong ball show. You know, yeah, like, yeah. Like oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Your choice. What, what did the two chicks one cup? Well, she found God and now she's... She's it's just one chick, two cups now. Yeah, it's right. just one chick. Yeah, and her really cup is. runneth over with yeah. the love of God. That's crazy. It's one, so, it's one cup and we can't tell if it's half full or half empty. So one they have Chandler's... And they pick some weird ones. Uh, man, I, I mean, like, how much of that do you think, uh, Reckless? Do you think is is legitimate? I mean, do you do you get the sense that some of it is just attention seeking, the channeling? Yeah, I mean, definitely a lot of these guys were certainly opportunists. There's no doubt. But what do I you mean, look? What do you look for when when you are evaluating the legitimacy or the likely, you know, the likely legitimacy of of these? of these uh, well, types of people. Oh, well, I mean, you got to, well, I mean, especially if you're talking about spies, I mean, you got to kind of keep in mind, none of them are ever truly legitimate. I mean, they're all bullshit artists to some level yeah, or another yeah, trying to create a mythos around them. So I tried to go buy as much of the hard background material that I can find around this stuff. And that's, you know, the thing with the nine where all of this gets really crazy, right? Because the guy who pushed this, for years was this Idrina Puharic guy, but he was doing some very serious work for the DOD and uh, the CIA for a time. And the way Puharic claimed, or the way he told it, is that he went to bat for all this stuff around 1947 on a project called Penguin. Now, there's never been any evidence to confirm that something named Penguin existed. Uh, and he claimed that this was part of the Navy. But it just so happens that in 1947, the Navy did launch a program that was known as Pelican. So it is pretty similar. Yeah. And Pelican is a really interesting program that's never talked about. It was basically a full-blown clockwork orange type procedure. So the Navy is trying to recruit people for special operations forces and assassinations, and they're scouring the military prisons and they're finding these candidates. They want to try to make them even more efficient killers. Oh my so God. they're being strapped into chairs, clamped down. Their eyes are literally being clamped open, just like in a clockwork orange. They're being drugged and they're shown these ultra violent movies in a bid to desensitize them. This is another reason, too, why I think that Kubrick was in on all of this, because, again, Clockwork Orange, there's some very pointed references oh. to this program that Puharic may have potentially been actively involved in. So this is some really nasty stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one other thing, again, I want to reiterate, the men that were being picked for this program were being taken out of military prisons and so forth. They were already picking people with a strong... Uh, inclination towards violence. So it does kind of beg the question just how much you really needed to desensitize these people. Oh, right, 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 right. And like I've said this before, 
You know, I had a, I had a friend before who couldn't pass the psychological exam to become a cop and he's the nicest guy i know for a while there before he did become a cop and it made me start to think that maybe he was too nice yeah maybe that ain't what they want for, yeah they want a guy who's like gonna you know gonna i mean again I, i'm really not in the mood to like bash cops even though i do believe that we need to have a checks and balances on that right that can't be just you know new jack city or some shit like that right we got to have it we have to have some balance um but I also think that they do want a certain type of of aggression in their cops. That if shit's a fan, they're ready to go. Within the, and they're looking for that action. See, but I also think there's some that if you might do great on that test, you can get a 1,000 and you get ranked the fuck up. Like, oh, you're perfect. You're exactly what we're looking for. You, you beat, you're more than average, and then they move you up, and now you're, you're part of the fucking police department in Vegas. Yeah. Right. And now you're part of the sheriff and now you can act like nothing happened. Yeah, I mean that's 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 what I just said basically, right? That's that's no, that well, they no, look uh, Well, you were saying how how they look for like people that are psycho? No, you said how your your friend was too good for Yeah, too not. Oh, you're also, saying also they want some of those people too? I also too? think that they also find and they look for people that are like super aggressive, super ready to yeah, fight yeah, 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 crimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They put them on the force and they're like, "Here, this guy will shoot a black guy for sure." Yeah, for that yeah, that's basically Part of what I don't, uh, part of what I believe does happen, that that they don't believe that everybody is perfect for. Again, I don't. I'm not hating on cops. I just was trying to figure out why this kid, who was the nicest kid I know, was having problems passing this test, and he ended up just now he's a cop, and I just like it. Just made me think that maybe they they don't want normal people. Like, and you're if you're in the military, they're doing tests on you all the time. Like, does everybody get a chance to become special ops or do they ask you if you want to become, because you have a certain level that they know they need for that. I mean, when you get out. No, out you of have the, to go through a personality profile, if I'm not mistaken. To right, get which goes reason. back to the last thing you talked about last time you were on the show. Like, what are these special classes about? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, like, I'm pretty sure when we're like. Like we we all have accepted that these phones mine our data, and we don't. And everyone's like, "Yep, what can you do?" But man, I think they've been doing data forever. They just had different ways to do it. Well, that was the Snowden thing, part, partly the 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 revelation that you know they were literally crunching all the data, you know, at that big facility, everything. Yeah. But even before, like the internet, like, hey man, how many how many times do you smoke cigarettes a week? And, like, yeah. they, they had like, yeah, they did like, they do, they would track like library book, you know, yeah, they would check out library books. Yeah, they had. So you, you have kids, Sam. Have you noticed any parenting or any tests that you might be like, okay, this is weird? Because that's when they start them young. You start taking these tests to find out if your kid is smart or if it's reading or not. Have you noticed anything? We're like, no, not yet. But are I, your kids I, in school yet? Well, they're preschool. Yeah. I know, but that's not like public, that's not like part of the system yet, really. Technically, right? Well, one one is, and the other one's in a private school that is like a Catholic school because I just don't want. The, I go, Are you guys doing woke stuff? They're like, we no. I go, you. I was trying to be nice about, it, so they didn't think I was like some psycho weird conspiracy <laughs> theorist. I'm like, oh, what are you guys like teaching? Are you guys doing any of that uh, uh, woke? No, we do none of that woke stuff. I'm like, thank God, she's coming to the school, and you know, it's like I. You know, and again, I would love to do uh, homeschooling. I don't know if that's an option right now. I don't want to hear about it, but we're, I would love that. But what right now, I want to hear about it because not everybody can do homeschooling. And make I make it seem very easy when it is very. It's I, I very it hard. Very. You have oh, to yeah. have the the right people involved with it wanting to do it. It, sh it should be yes. a community, like oh. Well, that's what yeah. a lot of it is. Well, yeah, you really need a community yeah, to do homeschooling effectively. I mean, that's from what a lot of my friends who told me have tried to do it. If you don't have like kind of a support network of people around you to like share the burden with, um, you know, with uh, other parents and stuff like that with their kids, it becomes kind of tricky to do everything yourself. There's funding for that now, though, right? At the, I think at the federal level, there's funding for community. Uh, well, I mean, they're like thinking about resources. making it illegal right now. Oh, that would suck. Whoa, for real? Yeah, they're trying. I mean, they're never going to be able yeah, to do be, it, yeah. but I mean, they're going to try. There's finally a movement, though. I think as we see this movement 
uh, against higher education, you know, against the university system. I think that will take the pressure off of, you know, the standardized nature of high school and middle school because, you know, the reason they say, oh, you got to pass all these standardized tests so you can get into college. But the, the emphasis is much less now on going to college, I think, finally, you know, because it's being exposed for the money-making sham it is that I think people will, the, you know, feel more comfortable pursuing uh, homeschooling. Well, I got murdered in um, on Twitter because they somebody put this out and it was like, hey, hey, uh, hey, can you do this third grade Chinese Math Ooh, equation. I couldn't have done it. I saw it. Okay. And, but by the way, they had like a, a, a 20 year old doing it in the video. I'm like, where's the three? Where's the where's the third grader Chinese? That's not third grader but Chinese. I also can't do the shit I could do in fifth grade. But I also whatever. said like, I'm 50 years old and I've never had to use this math any point. And they, they, they murdered me. I haven't done algebra in 20 years. They so. murdered me. Oh, you just, why don't you just admit you can't do the math? Dude, I'm functionally illiterate. What makes you think I could do math? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. It, it, the, no, and I, I saw the video because I thought I was like, let me see if I, I, there was no way. There was like four or five equations you had to memorize. It was like, find the area of the perimeter. Then there was these circles. And you set, but it's meant to saw. make Americans feel stupid. But we did That's that shit. And we did algebra when we were in school. Yeah, and then you graduated high school. Because you don't do it. You forget about and it. And you're yeah. like, I, this applies nowhere. And exactly. that was the point of what I did. Well, that's the point of the tweet. I've never used this in real life. I've never used it in my life. I'm 50 years old, never. done a million things in my life, never used it. Now, part of it is because, uh, you know, I've got a supercomputer in my pocket literally now. So, well, that's 100%. You know, and we, it's and I and don't know if that's good or bad. And Are it's we like, okay, go, you know, I mean, like, okay, the, the, th the third grade Chinese kids can do this math. If they're so smart, why are they jacking all of our ideas? Why are they yeah, spying on us left and right? Fair point there. You know, it's like it's obviously there's something about when you're overly structured. You don't think outside the box. You you don't allow creativity to happen, and that's a big problem with like communists. Now I know that China's evolving, but when you're telling people what they can do, what they can't do for work, you're not allowing people to thrive. That's my humble opinion. I don't know. Hey guys, real quick, I want to tell you about our friends at Fume. Let me tell you about Fume. Hey guys, real quick, I want to tell you about our friends at Fume. That's right. Cold turkey may be great on a sandwich, okay? But there are better ways to break your bad habits. We're not talking about some weird mind voodoo from your crazy neighbor or some crazy spiritual mumbo jumbo from hot chicks on TikTok, okay? We're talking about our sponsor, Fume. And they, they look at the problem in a different way. Not everything... And a bad habit is wrong. So instead of a drastic, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad from your habit? Okay, Fume is an innovative, award-winning device that does just that. Instead of electronics, Fume is na completely natural. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. Instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses all natural, delicious flavors. You get it. Instead of bad Fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy and making replacing your bad habit easy. Your fume comes in an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for your fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while you're breaking your habit, okay? I love it. I love it. it's well-weighted, perfectly balanced, extremely fun to fidget with. It's made of real wood. And the shapes are insane. It feels cool using it. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard. But switching the fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 100,000 customers and has thousands of successful stories. And there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating hu humanity's breakup with destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Try fume.com and use code tinfoil to save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. Okay. Try fume, F U M.com and use the code tinfoil for additional 10% off your, your journey pack today. 
Enjoy! Hey guys, real quick, I want to tell you about this new project I'm working on. It's called Chaos Twins. I'm doing with the Paranoid American, and it is a comic book based on two twin girls who fight crime in their neighborhood. And it's my attempt at doing some family-friendly entertainment. It's a comic book, and we're looking for people to sign up and help us. If we get enough people to sign up for it, we're going to make a bunch of copies. And I, I think it's great. It's going to be, if you're into conspiracies and you're looking for family-friendly entertainment that you can read with your children so they can enjoy it, Chaos Twins is it. It's a story about two twin girls who move to a new neighborhood, realize that something's up, and realize they have superpowers. One can transform into a bear, and the other one can transform into any bird they want, and they fight the deep stay in their neighborhood. Each house is a different conspiracy they're going to bear. It's a great way to teach your kids about conspiracies while having fun at the same time. And it's all you have to do is go to chaostwins.com or thechaostwins.com or even samtripoli.com and and, and uh, click the banner. But go there, click it, and uh, get on the mailing list. And if you can join us, it'd be really great. Uh, we appreciate you. And uh, just check it out. ChaosTwins.com. Now let's get back to the show. Yeah, I want to go back to this. So did we get into uh, Project Pelican yet? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Oh. So, okay. So this is super interesting because, again, you know, with this Q stuff, we've had this conversation before about, like, I mean, I think all of us would agree Q is a PSYOP, right? But in Operation Truth, there was a lot of truth to that. Like, Operation Truth told you the truth. That's it was used a long time ago. They had to tell you the truth to, to bring to get all the paranoid people to believe in it. So yeah. when you go, and I, I'm sorry, I, we already covered this. My apologies, but do you think the nine was real, or do you think it was a psyop operation? Well, that's again where it gets like really interesting because you can look at the pros and cons with this. So on the con side, when Puharic was brought back into the security services in the fifties. He was brought into the psychological uh, warfare department of what became the Special Operations Command. And this is the whole time frame where basically the military especially was investing a fortune in researching all of these different traditions, the magical traditions, like they're researching witchcraft in the Congo and all this kind of stuff. I mean, literally, they're sending anthropologists all over the freaking world to study this kind of stuff and how it can be weaponized and so forth. But on the flip side of the coin, You've got these early Bluebird committees, which became uh, Project Artichoke, and they had the same committee for them. And the people involved with this stuff in the early days were just absolutely nuts. Yeah. So it's it's connected to a committee that was run by Vannevar Bush. And for those of you unaware, this was the guy who for years was said to be the big poobah behind Majestic 12 and all this other stuff, of course. More tangible, we have the Smith memo, which suggested that Bush was the one who was running uh, the UFO studies in the United States. But concurrently with all this going on, he's also in this committee that's connected to all this early research of Bluebird and Artichoke. One of his protégés was a guy called H. Marshall Chadwell, who was a part of the Robertson panel, which was big with uh, early ufology and developing the narrative for that. But he also was a guy who directed Artichoke at the same time he's doing all this. That's so true. you've got all of these people tied in, not just with the nine, but with the early ufology. They're absolutely immersed in all of these, you know, behavior modification techniques. They developed this thing called the Artichoke treatment where essentially you're trying to induce narco hypnosis. And a lot of times they would give these people this, this uh, concoction called Smasher, I think, or Slammer. And it was LSD nice. mixed with this uh, thing called, I think, Metatronin or something like that. Oh. But it was something that essentially induced convulsions in people. So oh my God. they're strapping you into a chair. They're giving you a heroic dose of LSD with this drug that makes you go into uncontrollable convulsions, right? Oh. <laughs> They're going into you know psych wards, prisons, POW camps. They're doing this to hundreds, probably thousands of people. That's insane, even after, dude. Even after it's a lot of evidence coming out that it's not working. So why do they keep doing this crap? And then you start looking at some of the other people that were tied into this committee. 
And one of them is a real interesting guy called Cleve Baxter, who became really big in New Age circles after he was claim, claimed that he could communicate with plants with a polygraph. There was a really famous book written about that in the 70s called uh, by Christopher, Obr Christopher O'Bird and I think Peter Tompkinson or something like that. Uh, but it led into this whole issue where you could communicate, you know, with your house plants and stuff like that with the polygraph. So cleaves this this really you know neat little guy right but uh back in the day he was the head poobah for this whole method of narco hypnosis so he ends crazy. up becoming involved with this group that i told you about before the sovereign order of saint john that george hunt williamson was a member of that had a lot of these other kooky chandlers like delmar de Barris. he was another one of those guys who thought that uh these great advanced civilizations were communicating with him to tell him that the Jews really were evil after all. Was <laughs> good stuff. So Cleve is involved in this group. He's gone around the country. He's meeting with all of these UFO contactees like Travis Walton and people like that. He's basically filing reports with them and sending them back to the order, which is just absolutely wash with all of these senior military guys and a uh, general this colonel that you've got other people involved with it like colonel philip corzo who wrote the day after roswell probably the biggest ufo book so all these guys are there and some of them like baxter have these connections to things like artichoke and this is where you start getting into some of the the my lab allegations right of these military induced abductions and all this other kind of stuff oh that's crazy so i mean i mean do, is there a party that thinks that maybe this artichoke operation artichoke is like somewhat could have created serial killers well that's what i was kind of hinting at with this stuff with project pelican because remember you're talking about people who were taken out of military prisons, who already had shown a high degree of uh, oh the use to the ability God, to use violence, bro. right? So, do these guys really need to be desensitized? But when you get into literature related to things like possession, right? Well, theoretically, there's got to be a certain hole in your soul to begin with to be possessed. So think about that for a minute. You're taking people out of prisons who have already committed heinous acts of violence. You're maybe pumping them through of psychedelics. Got all these people around here who think that they're communicating with aliens or whatever. So do they start wondering if maybe we can channel something into these people oh, man. when we're doing these experiments to them? That is, that, dude, this is where the dark art stuff comes in. And this is where I, th again, we've talked about in the last couple shows. I don't think the Nazis lost World War II. I think they just walked right over here and set up these operations through the CIA, right? I mean, the Roman Catholic, the Roman Empire becomes Catholic Church. The British Empire becomes the Bank of England. And the Nazis become the CIA, and uh, and they've hijacked our military. That is what my belief is for sure. So they're running these psychological operations. Right around when the CIA comes over here, what happens? Now we start seeing all this alien stuff. Now we start, and like, dude, like, this is, like, insane to me. So it's like now we start seeing things where, we, you know, you, you didn't get into it, but I, I really... I think it's interesting where you said that does the nine appear in the JFK assassinations, well, Watergate, you know, all that crazy shit. Like, oh. well, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely freaking nuts when you're looking at the prospect of, um, I mean, like with the Watergate stuff too, it's absolutely insane because the guy connected to the nine with that is James McCord, who was uh, most likely a part of all this stuff with Artichoke when he was in the CIA in the Office of Security. Oh my and again, God, he's actually appears to be running or at least connected to a sex ring that was being run out of the Watergate Hotel what? by this woman named Heidi Reinken whose father had literally immigrated from Nazi Germany. She was born in Nazi Germany. Uh, she, 
she went into the army in 1957 suddenly left after like six months or something in there became this uh madam for like these various gangsters uh throughout the 60s and then she set up this elaborate call girl ring that was servicing a lot of the uh politicians tied into the watergate hotel and this is really the backdrop right of Watergate, which is the things that they really didn't want coming out, because you had this sex ring, you had it being run by this guy McCord, who was involved with all these people who were running Project Artichoke. You got this Heidi Reineken chick, who, again, parents, she was born in Nazi Germany. Holy she became shit. this. You know, again, you got to wonder about this stuff. And, you know, I kind of set out on this research to try to debunk a lot of these conspiracy theories, but you Holy keep shit, encountering man. this kind of insanity. It's so, so what you're saying in a weird way, and maybe not in a weird way, maybe it is the way, is that the, the scandal of Watergate as we know it, okay, as we know it, it was a smokescreen for something crazier that was going on there that they didn't want you to look at. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that, this is... Go ahead. And that, to me, fits into the whole Pizzagate scandal, right? Like, they make you think, oh, oh, duh. You think know, they, they had kids in a, in a, in a basement and a pizza place and they're doing all that. The stuff that the kids at the pizza place and they don't even have a basement? Man, you're stupid. And it's like, no, that's not what it's really about. What it's really about is that there's a giant pedophile ring that's blackmailing the entire of Washington, D.C. And it's like goes again back to this thing where it's like, oh, you'll accept Jeffrey Epstein, but you won't accept Pizzagate, right? Like, it's so hilarious to me. It's so, and like, I, I this may not be your thing, Stephen, but, you know, You'll, you'll accept the Van Allen belt, but you won't set, accept the firmament. It's like these things that are, that are, that are comfortable for sheep, but not come, but other things aren't, even though they're talking about the same thing. But back to this, this is amazing to me. And really why this shocks me, Steven, is because I saw this and I did on uh, Deep Conspiracy Rewinds on uh, Rockfin is I get into, um, I get into how uh, there was a 60 Minutes article when 60 Minutes did really good work or what appeared to be good work about a Boston lawyer who did who did deep research into how the Nazis came here and he totally 100% found out that Richard Nixon was part of a small group that helped bring the Nazis to the United States. And that was right after Tucker Carlson was trying to convince everybody that kind of... You know, Nixon kind of got a bad rap. And I'm like, what? And then this this video popped up out of nowhere. And I was like, so like when you're talking about like artichoke, Nazis, all that shit, that lines up completely with what you said about Watergate in my eyes. I'll do you even one better here. Ah, um, so getting okay. into all right, okay, so I basically covered most of the stuff that is in the first book, and, uh, well, there's a lot of other stuff, too, with psychotronic weapons and what have you, but I'll uh, give you a bit of a hint where I'm going at with the second one here. And this involves a guy called George Adell, who was at the, at the center of a lot of scandals in L.A. around 1950. And most of this concerned the allegations that he had raped his 13-year-old daughter, oh. Tamara Hodel, who would subsequently go on to become a mentor to Michelle Phillips of the Mamas and Papas and to be tied into that whole... Oh, my there. God. But Mr. Hodel also, in recent years, there's been compelling evidence coming out to indicate that he was involved in the murder of Elizabeth Short, more commonly known as the Black Dahlia, which is one of the most notorious and ritualistic murders in the history of the 20th century United States. It seems to have been absolutely steeped in surrealism and all this other really occultic artwork. The thing about Hodel is that after he was able to beat this rap of uh, raping his preteen daughter, he uh, left the United States for many years, and he ended up in a place that we have been talking about 
a lot in this podcast, and that is the Philippines. Why he was there, worked for a couple of government agencies, one of them being the U.S. Information Agency, which is very interesting because the guy I was just talking about before, Edward Lansdale, the guy who uh, liked to have people killed and drained of blood and puncture wounds, the yeah. so they thought vampires, well... Lansdale used the U.S. Information Agency a lot for his operations in the Philippines and later in Vietnam. And beyond that, he had a lot of friends who worked at the U.S. Uh, Information Agency in the Philippines for many years. Most notably, the woman that he had a long time affair with and later married, who was an employee of the USIA for several decades and almost surely would have been working there while George Fidel was doing contract work for them. And um, if you followed any of the research that uh, his son Steve Adele has done on him, there's a good chance that Elizabeth Short was not the only person that George Adele had murdered or been involved in. He might have been involved in the red lipstick murders in Chicago and possibly also the Zodiac killings later in the 1960s. The okay. bad dude. A bad, bad dude. This is so, crazy. Wait, so they, they think he could have been the Zodiac or responsible for some of those? What are, what are you saying? Well, I'm going to get into that, but oh, okay. I think Sorry. that he was probably involved in a network related to the Zodiac killings because, again, there seems to be a military connection with that. Yeah, yeah Adele yeah. was a big guy in Los Angeles. He essentially seems to have been a guy tied in with an abortion ring that was doing abortions for celebrities. And keep in mind, this is like the 1940s, right? So, I mean, abortion is a big crime back then and he's doing this for a lot of prominent people he was also effectively the venereal uh, czar or something like that and then he later ended up doing a lot of work for the un the venereal uh, czar oh yeah what, what's you know la needs a venereal disease so. some guys like i am king of the stds <laughs> worship me or get chlamydia <laughs> Take out my stuff. army of herpes. I'd love to see that on a business card. Yeah. yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm in charge of venereal disease. You know how everybody asks you what you do at these Hollywood parties? You know, it's like, hey, what do you do? I had just a VD. I'm are, a venereal czar, bro. <laughs> yeah. Wait, so the, the military Go. connection is is that the uh, is that the book rentals from all from the military bases? Is that the what what are the other military connections there with the Zodiac? I mean, because I, I know that well, was I mean, one of the connections that they thought that most. They, you know, there's that connection between the books all about you know, the killing and, and, you know, of people and like uh, binding people up and stuff were taken out of apparently uh, libraries on military bases. Uh, I know that's one of the connections. What are some of the others? I'm curious. Oh, I know another one was the shoes. Uh, there was, uh, oh, I think right, at the least boots, right? the crimson. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It looked like they were at least military surplus boots. Um, several of the killings took place near military bases. So there were definitely, and then so just in general, the precision of it as well. But I mean, this is like where it gets really nutty because on top of that, the Zodiac, the crime has really eerie similarities to uh, the Phantom Killer, I think is what it was what? called, the Moonlight Murderer, you know, the one that they depicted in the town, the dreaded sundown. So, which incidentally, also these killings happened in 1946, which was like the year before the Black Dahlia murder. But, you know, again, I don't know if there was any direct connection to that or not, but it seems clear that whoever was doing the Zodiac killings had deliberately modeled them partly on uh, the Moonlight murders, because it's basically the same scenario in the early um, killings that were attributed to the Zodiac, where you've got a guy going into the lover's lanes, finding these isolated couples, he's wearing a mask. In the case of the uh, Moonlight murder, it was like a white hood. The Zodiac, of course, later did the black hood and the whole, you know, super villain, you know, costume thing or whatever the hell you want to call that. So uh, it's definitely interesting because in a lot of these cases, uh, to me, the almost the most fascinating thing about this is the interaction that these serial murders had with the media and how they are essentially trying to construct a character to attribute these crimes to, which is a tradition that goes back really to Jack the Ripper himself, something that seems to keep occurring over and over again with these really high profile serial killings. That is so you think now is your suggestion that that they are intentionally misleading? They they kind of create that persona to take on the 
you know, they'll take the heat and then and then maybe it's a group possibly that's doing the killings. Is that yeah, I mean, something to that effect. But I mean, I also wonder to some extent if you're also most creating like uh, an egregor or something like that, because I mean, yeah. a lot of these guys are very much steeped in magic, right? So you have these killers that are, you know, in the case of the Black Dahlia murders with the Black Dahlia Avenger letters with Jack the Ripper, with Zodiac. You know, they're basically creating these elaborate mythos around themselves and subsequently they've all become pop culture staples, right? And I mean, that in and of itself is almost a kind of magical work. And it kind of goes back to the very basis of abracadabra. As I speak, I create. Yeah, when you, you know, as, true. You, you as they that. kill, they create. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. But and you hear that about the people that work those cases and the people that were involved in, in investigating it, you know, outside of the the justice system. They they all seem uh, obsessed with, it. you know, it's something that, you know, lived with them the rest of their lives uh, as though it had some kind of supernatural uh, you know, attraction. No, but you're totally, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I get that. You always hear that haunt me every. Yeah, I think yeah, about yeah. it every Zodiac, day, especially, yeah, yeah. And well, it's in this what, case, I mean, they haunted entire communities. I mean, just look at how you know Zodiac terrified San Francisco in that period. Yeah, they had. Right? Didn't they I have? Mean, didn't they have curfews during? Uh, yeah, imagine yeah, that yeah. a curfew because a guy was just killing people. <laughs> Or, I mean, the son of Sam. I mean, this is another one where you have the whole media campaign playing into that. I mean, just look what it did to New York City. New York City, right? I mean, it's one thing if it does this to a California city, but I mean, it's freaking New York, right? Who's uh, who's uh, Richard Ramirez? Did wasn't he scary? Like, in LA? Yeah, 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 that's a creep. And then, and then when they discovered it was him, like his whole neighborhood beat the shit out oh, of yeah, him. Oh yeah, they didn't. They didn't even let him run. He's the creepiest dude, too. And then there were chicks trying to bang him. But, hey, oh. I think what you're saying is very interesting. You know, That kind of explains the chicks trying to bang him thing, though, right? This supernatural The magic, to, yeah. yeah. Well, and, well, it's like you're kind of talking about earlier with Hitler, where, I mean, it was like there was almost that, you know, inner force that was attractive to people that he was channeling. I mean, I think to some extent... When you do get into some of these characters, I mean, because George Adele was another guy. I mean, he was also a bit of a ladies' man, even though I mean, he was also this monstrous figure in so many levels, right? So yeah, yeah so I often mean, they kinda... are kind of ladies' men, but they hate women, isn't that? You see that with like Ted Bundy. Yeah, but they're like they're like this weird kind of thing where it's like, they, like, what when people go, Ted Bundy was super handsome. No. Ted Bundy was good looking for a serial killer yeah. when most serial well, he killers was apparently charming though. About ugly. Like it's comics. Like outside of Matt Rife, every single comic that was like, oh dude, he like he he he's a he's such a hot comic. Like, no, he's good looking for a yeah. comedian. But he was charming though, Ted Bundy. That's, like, not, that, that, that's not that good looking. That's, that's not, not that like... good. He's just not like a quasimodo he's that most bad. of these I mean, guys yeah, are. Yeah, you're right. You're right. No, you're right. Right, but, but, he's like, I think it's like they say he was. It's like the magnetism. Yeah, when well, I mean, like it's something that in comedy and entertainment I call the Elvis factor. I mean, that top right photo is kind of. And you can just get into like numerology of when you're born and all that stuff, and whether you believe in that, I do. But you do. Yeah, I do. I do. I do believe in that and astrology and all that. It's like just certain people have certain kind of attraction they just attract people you walk in they have a different energy i mean they say that about trump you've heard people that hate trump be like oh dude all of a sudden he's there and you're just like yeah he's in the room you're like oh dude he's got what he has biden would pay uh infinity money to have i mean you just will never have that they just don't have that they don't have anybody who has that and it's so interesting i don't think trump can teach that to someone no you can't you can't it's like you can't teach like it's very weird. Stand-ups where they're always like, you can't teach funny. Well, I mean, if you learn the right kind of paradigms, you could say, oh, black people walk like this, white people walk like that, and you'll get a certain part of the segment. Or my mom You become an actor, right, essentially. You're doing somebody, possibly you get a writer, do the material, and then you become an actor on stage, yeah, right? Yeah, so you can in that sense, but it's it's like you can't teach char- charisma. You can't teach it. It's just you have it or not. Like... I guess women can do that with makeup where it's like, you know, because like the whole thing is that fallen angels taught women makeup and it's like, it's all that dark. Is that a real thing? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) They came down and taught them secrets that they shouldn't have known. I heard that part, but I didn't know it was makeup. Which was makeup. One of it was makeup. 
I love and that. like the voodoo of makeup. Like when Jordan Peters like, well, if you're so worried about sexual harassment, maybe we should get rid of makeup in the workplace. And women freaked out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was totally right because like the the painting of your face is to give the illusion of you just got done having sex. Yeah, the flushed cheeks. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But it's all psychological. But going back to this whole thing, it's like the the smiley face killers. They they make you want to think it's one person, but there's also a belief that it might be a bunch of people. Do you think they could be part of some Project Artichoke, Project MK Ultra? One hundred percent, or just some dark arts thing, man. But like this Project Artichoke to me is like. Like that hits a nail on like the creation of of these almost like in, in everything else controlled opposition, agent provocateurs, all this stuff that caused chaos. Cause you know, when everyone gets into Israel versus Palestine, you see all these people in the truth community totally throwing out all their expertise that they've applied to every other high impact event happening and they just go emotionally uh, in, in head first into this conflict and forgetting everything that they've been preaching about for years if not decades and you know and it's just like if you know the playbook which is create the problem offer the solution so you know it's like why law enforcement don't want drugs to be illegal i mean because a big part of their budget is going to fighting yeah. illegal drugs if the drugs are all legal what do we got now so they want to keep it illegal. Well, you know, if you're law enforcement and you you want to, I, I, like, I, you know, when we did that episode on Broward County, right, all the psyops that have come out of there, one of the biggest ones was Adam, um, who disappeared. What's the kid's name? Adam, um, his dad. Oh, went, Walsh. Adam Walsh. Oh, yeah. But you know what Adam Walsh did? It, like, it, it stopped children from playing outside. My kids don't, I mean, they're only three, so they wouldn't do that, but they don't play outside. The they, part you don't hear about as much, too, is not only did the police want that, the illicit drug dealers don't don't want it being legalized either. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, they were they, that was a bargain that they both had, and they kind of you know they worked. They had their own code that agreed between them, and they wanted to continue that way. Forever. The only thing that saved weed dealers is the tax on weed. No, that nobody yeah. wants to go to the, the to oh. the weed shop. They'd rather go back to their old drug dealer. Mm -hmm. But the cartel uh, don't want it. Yeah. I mean, that's for sure. Uh, uh, does uh, Charles Manson fit anywhere here? One hundred percent. Like, is oh, he, yeah. But, yeah, but like, which was he part? Was he artichoke? Was he before? Was he MK? Like, because I mean, he it seems like he was artichoke. Oh uh, yeah, I mean it's you know it's not like the simplest thing to like break down here with the time that we've got left, but you know kind of getting back to what I was saying, you have to like really look at these circles around Michelle Phillips and some of the other people uh, that were tied into that sort of Hollywood scene. So she's dating uh, Jack Nicholson, right? Uh, so this starts bringing in all the stuff with the Polanskis with all these other people, but on top of that. Um, the guy who really launched the career for a lot of the counterculture figures in Hollywood, like Nicholson and Peter Fonda and all this, was this producer called Bert Snyder, okay? He's the guy who produced Easy Rider. He was the guy who set up BBS Production, which is also where, like, five easy pieces. And more or less, this is the beginning of, like, indie filmmaking in the United States as we know it, okay? So Bert does this, and he's also really big in activism. He basically was funding uh, the Black Panthers heavily by the early 1970s. And on top of that, he was also Huey Newton's good friend and potentially lover as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was also massively funding the Yippies, all these other groups. But see, here's where this gets like really interesting because he's in all these circles around Manson. Um, his longtime girlfriend, Candace Bergen, had actually been dating uh, Terry Melcher, I think, at the time of the Manson killings. So all of these like circles interact with that. A guy like Bert Snyder, he gets approached by Mr. Daniel Ellsberg, the famous whistleblower, right, who just yeah, recently yeah. died. Okay, so Ellsberg was in Vietnam. And who did he serve under when he was in Vietnam? He served under Edward Lansdale. 
guy we've been talking about all mm. this. And he was a really good friend of Edward Lansdale. In fact, when uh, Max Boot interviewed uh, Ellsberg about Lansdale in 2018, he said he loved Lansdale. He was in the cult of Edward Lansdale, literally referred to it as a cult. So here's a guy who's so closely connected to Lansdale, who befriends this big Hollywood producer who's funding all of these left-wing groups and this kind of thing. And the more that I've been digging into that, I have to feel that the Manson stuff was also part of this whole milieu that was unfolding in L.A. And I mean, again, I, this I also... I couldn't agree more. I mean, it also, I think, goes back even with George Adele, because you got to remember Tamara Hodell, his daughter... Uh, was a mentor to Michelle Phillips. I mean, she was kind of tied in to all these circles. And then you have a guy like Jack Nicholson, who is dating Angelica Houston for a lot of years. Her father, John Houston, the director, was a really good friend of George Adele. They had actually known each other, I think, since like college years or something like that. And apparently some of the stuff in Chinatown was actually based on things that Tamar had told uh, Michelle Phillips, who in turn told them to Jack Nicholson when they were dating, right? Huh. So I've always found it interesting that this was the specific circle that Manson, uh, you know, went after, especially when you get into all these rumors around uh, the Planskys, essentially, that they were filming these really violent pornos that maybe you had some of these celebrities that were involved. And I mean, this has always been one of the sort of dark rumblings around Hollywood for years. The porn has been used as a major form of black male and control for various celebrities. And again, when you start looking at Adele and some of the Hollywood circles around him, you know, you just keep coming back to that. I mean, Stanley Kubrick, a guy who is also connected to all of this, uh, he wanted to do a big budget porno movie throughout the 1960s. Terry Southern Raider wrote a screenplay <laughs> that's called Blue Movie. But I think Kubrick, as with a lot of this other stuff, was really uh, interested in shining a light on uh, some of these more nefarious dealings. And I mean, he would know. You know, he did Lolita, the uh, lady who starred in Lolita's the title character, Sue Loin. She was actually raped by James B. Harris during this production. Oh, or at least my Michelle damn. Phillips alleged that when she was 14 years old. Okay. Harris was Kubrick's production partner. He dissolved the partnership right after they did Lolita. Um, they had signed Sue Loin to this like nine picture deal or something like that. Uh, it ended up going to Seven Artists production, which um, Harris was working with. And Seven Artists is run by this guy named Ray Stark, who also, I mean, he was the agent for Ben Hesch, who was a guy that George Adele absolutely idolized. And on top of that, like the next movie that they send this poor girl to is The Night of the Iguana that John Huston directed. So... I mean, you just have like this whole insane thing around Lolita alone where the star is raped. It's even rumored, you know, in the gossip columns at the time that Harris is sexually engaged with this 16 year old girl when he's like in his mid 30s. Nobody says anything about this. And this went on for several months. And there were indications that Peter Sellers might even have been involved in, you know, this insanity, too. So I mean, this stuff was, you know, I mean, it's not even like that hidden. And this it's is the whole so thing. It's so crazy because if you don't study it, you will you don't see it. And you just think this is a natural progression yeah. of human culture. That's what you think. But what you don't understand is there's this hidden hand trying to get people to act in ways that they can point to and go, look at this crazy unsafe person. You need us to help you with that. It's nuts. It's all nuts right now. It is all nuts. It's all that nuts. It I, I can't believe it's like it just shocks me. It just really shocks me. So I know we don't have you for much longer. Uh I want to go. You you brought up something earlier that I don't really what were some uh you brought up Watergate. Do you have anything about the nine in the JFK assassination? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So um in that case, uh you had the Oswalds living with uh Ruth Forbes Payne and Michael Payne. And um, Michael Payne 
was the son, if I remember correctly, of one of the people who was involved in the channeling of the Nine. And then his stepfather was Arthur Young, who was another guy deeply involved in the channeling of the Nine and who had worked with Pew Hart closely uh, for quite a few years. And then on top of that, too, the uh, the Riley Coffee Company that Oswald worked with, what? worked for uh, in the run up to the assassination, the guy who owned that actually had uh, some connections to Morris Allen, who was the guy who ran Project Artichoke. Um, so, yeah, you know, you have Oswald living with the stepson of one of the people who channeled the nine. You have him working for a company tied into Artichoke, which Pew Harik was uh, actively engaged in. So, and again, it shows up. And like that, the psychological implications of the JFK assassination, which is like what some anniversaries coming up right now. Unbelievable, dude. Well, those are like, I mean, when you look at JFK and Watergate, I mean, those are really the two pivotal events, right? Because, I mean, look at what they did to the perception of the American government. I mean, up to that point, you know, we pretty much universally trusted our government and believed yeah. in it. And just the the shock of those two events permanently changed the society on so many levels. Well, I, I agree. And that is the, the George Bush death cult that steps in and takes over the U.S. government with the help of these Nazi fucks, which George Bush's dad funded in the... I, dude, it's all dark arts. It's all dark arts. That's what people don't understand. It's all dark. None of this is natural. None of this is just happening by chance. It is all done by an invisible hand of dark arts, and it's just ridiculous. I mean, it's just crazy, dude. And, like... Why wouldn't serial killers be any different? What I what I can't wait is no not that can't wait, but I can't episode one thousand of Tinfoil and we find out that they were using Project Something for these mass shooters. Oh dude. And it's just a matter of we like I wonder know that. You I know, but away. I, I want to know what the project is. It's not gonna be Project MK Ultra, it's not gonna be Project Artichoke, it's gonna be a new name and they use they use social media somehow and I'm just like, they're doing it right now. If they did it before, they're doing it now. The truth be told, I mean, a lot of this stuff probably isn't even done by the government anymore. I would suspect this kind of stuff now is probably carried out by these private military companies. I mean, I think it was like Eric Prince more or less got like Dewey, oh God, the CIA station chief in Turkey and um, Italy during the years of lead. I can't remember his name now, but he basically was the guy who managed the CIA's like unofficial death squad uh, for a couple of decades. And then it was basically turned over to Eric Prince, I think around like 2004, 2005. Oh God, Eric yeah. Prince. That's a name we haven't heard for a while, which makes me very fucking nervous that we haven't heard from him and all of his shady shit, yeah. what he's but, up I mean, to. Oh. But I mean, when you look at a group like Dying Corps, where it's like, you know, on top of everything else that they're engaged in, they're also heavily uh, implicated in trafficking, human trafficking, sex slaves, all this stuff in the Balkans uh, during the Kosovo conflict. So, I mean, you know, this is 20 years ago. I mean, God only knows what some of these companies have gotten up to in the intern. And it's not even a Freedom of Information Act in this case. It's so crazy, dude. It's so, it's just like, I, dude, I honestly believe if none of this, if there wasn't this small, broken, dangerous, nasty, dark arts, worshiping occultists, sorcerers who run the world, we wouldn't be going, we would have so less chaos in our life. I mean, they, uh, they have every moment of our data down to a T, they know if they do this, this will happen. If they do that, that will happen. And they just keep inflicting chaos. And it's just like, I'm just sad, dude. I'm just sad, dude. Sad, sad times. It's crazy. Man, I, you got me thinking how they have everything to like, oh, if we tell them that we bombed the hospital in Gaza, this is how they're going to react. And yeah. then they do, and they're like, look, perfect. It worked I mean, exactly how AI told us. Johnny did say it, man. He's like, I'm... Uh, you know, keeping himself out of this, and it's just—it's so easy, easy to be led around by your nose um, uh, right now. You know, when it's so emotional. I just like that, you know. So we got a house speaker now. That just happened. The first thing they do oh, is we? 
pass up. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, did we get a house speaker yet? <laughs> yeah, we just got it. Some dude no one's heard of. And the first thing he does is passes a, 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 a bill or an act that gives open-ended military support to Israel. It's like, here we are, guys. CNN calls him a key figure in failed efforts to overturn the 2020 election. <laughs> Sure they love that. Well, you got to love the irony now that we're giving extensive military support on the one hand to um, hardline Zionist, on the other hand to um, Ukrainian fascists. Yeah, I, I mean, like, they, there you go, nonlinear warfare. We like we uh, we play all the sides, not just one side, all the sides, all the time. That's how we do it. And I, I'm sorry, this might upset people, but I believe Israel is the 51st state. It's not another country. It's the fifty-first state, and they just. Do you mean that literally when yeah. you say that? I no, really, I honestly, that. do believe that. I mean, it's called the state of Israel because it's a nation state. You know, it's like a, it's it's an ethnic, like a, you know, or a, 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 a group identity of you know the Israelis. Right. Then, I, I I I I I hear that. I think it's the fifty-first state. Yeah, but I mean, that would have to. Be, our government works on the principle that you know we have these things written down somewhere. You don't. Well, I, I mean. I, uh, okay, well, Johnny. I just, I'm no, I sorry. Mean, what are you basing that? I on? mean, we're literally you feel just, like that, or you heard that? No, like, I, what are you basing I, that? On? I'm basing that off on my instincts. Okay, so well, well I mean, so it it's is not real. Well, no, I mean, I thought you maybe somebody had had found some papers or something, but I mean, they wouldn't just think they wouldn't that. react like that to anybody else. They I'm just telling all you, that dude. Money. It's I it, mean, it's Ukraine, so much like through that. It is so much like Alaska to me, and the geopolitical. What about Taiwan? That is, that is maybe, but the geopolitical position of Alaska to uh, uh, to Russia, I can see the Russia from my house, <laughs> right? The good old days. And then Whoa. what Israel is is the same thing. Maybe Taiwan is that as well. I don't know. I think they would give well, away Alaska before they would give away Israel, but I'm not. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Fuck, that'd be crazy. If the, yeah, I think it's easier actually, Sam, that it's not a state because they can do all this shit off the books. If well, yeah, it was a 100%, state, it would have to be a board. But I'm saying, is it literally? Yeah, well, I just asked you, is it literally? And you said, well, yeah. Well, I but. mean, it, it is. I do believe it is, but it's off the books. That's not. So not literally, but like effectively it is. Yeah, I guess. Okay, okay, effectively is the word. That's what I believe. All right, all right, all right, all right. We've gone far enough. Uh Recluse, would you like to give uh, one more time, tell them where they can find you, anything you want to push? Yeah, I, as I said before, I'm the longtime curator of the Visa blog, uh, which you can find pretty basic Google search with V-I-S-U-P. Uh, I am the host of the Farm Podcast. I've uh, got a free show out once a week, every Monday, and then I've also got additional ones for subscribers on the Patreon. Find that under the Farm Podcast Mach 2 and any kind of uh, decent search engine. And I am the author of three books, the most recent one that I have relied upon heavily for this presentation, which is The Art, The Secret History of Psy Work and Spiritainment, and The Shattering of Reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also there find a lot of stuff on uh, the origins of this predictive modeling with data mining that Sam's been talking about, which actually also goes back to Edward Lansdale, like many other of the great evils that we are confronted with in the 21st century. And I was frankly shocked to find that out as well. But no, the figure within ARPA who was directing uh, the use of the early internet and counterinsurgency was actually reporting to Edward Lansdale throughout this whole time frame and not anybody in ARPA. So besides trying to convince Filipino villagers that they are being assaulted by vampires, he was also the visionary behind using computers for data mining and counterinsurgency. So there you go, Ed. You are all over the place. Uh, well, we always love talking to you. You crushed it. Even when you allowed us to go on our weird tangents, it was still a great, great episode. As always, with you, so thankful you come on, guys. Again, check out my go uh, my Indiegogo for the the new comic book, uh, the Chaos Twins. Okay, we're very excited about that. We get enough people, we're going to start printing the first uh, issues, and then if that does well, we'll create more issues because we want to make this uh, a thing for people to read to their kids. That's that's what we want to do. It is Sam Tripoli's attempt at family-friendly entertainment. Let's see how it goes. Support us so we can support you guys. 
And again, uh, check out our affiliates. I love them all. I work with them personally, and I'm very thankful that they all work with me. And enjoy these highlights. Check out my dates, too. Check out my dates. Again, we're going to be in Indianapolis, in St. Louis, uh, out in Belfort, Cal uh, California, Austin, Dallas. Go check it out, samtribble.com. Enjoy the highlights. Here's a clip from the latest Broken Sim. Uh, according to the latest poll released Monday, 37% of registered voters say they would support Biden. 36% say they would support Trump. And then you have RFK Jr. and Cornell West at 13 and 4% respectively. So it's I'm going Bi to be honest Biden with 30, you. Biden 37, Trump 36. I, I don't know anybody who's pro-Biden. I just like, I, I question any of that, dude. I know, but how many of those people are, are bra out there talking about it? You know what I mean? It's just something you kind of just. I just don't buy that at all. I know plenty of people. Though. Like, I know I most, most of the people I know back home are going to be voting. I just like like that, my friends from high school that aren't that political and don't aren't informed. I just, all just think, like, oh, I'm I not just, voting for Trump. Obviously. And then I and I go, maybe we deserve World War Three. Maybe we deserve our empire to crumble because we are such an un. Not that Trump is the answer, but it's not Biden. Nothing good has happened. And if you just and it's like my problem when the Republicans voted Bush after he lied us into Iraq. Yeah, that's crazy. It's like, you get what you deserve. And I 100% believe that, you know, what we've done to the Middle East is maybe why all this chaos is going on in this country. It is a spiritual blowback for a genocide of an area. Spiritual that's blowback. That's funny. That's a good, that's a good way to put that. That's a hundred percent right. That's my opinion. I wanted to, uh, Piers Morgan had this guy on the other day called Bassam Yusuf. And this guy, Bassam Yusuf, just kind of destroyed Piers Morgan. Oh, Johnny, it was the best thing. It is what comedy is meant to be. Yeah, it, it was the some of the best comedy in the form of satire that I've seen in a long time. It's what The Daily Show used to do before it completely sold its soul. And oh, Did you see Jon Stewart lost his show? Did he? Oh, well, nice. they say he quit, but the writing was on the wall. Interesting. Uh, there was hardly any good writing on that show. As I recall. But I, to be serious, uh, Bassam, about this, tonight there okay, is... I would be serious. Now, I, I, I would be serious. I was watching your interview with Ben Shapiro, and I'll tell you one thing. Yeah. I think that Ben Shapiro is one of the smartest people who ever walked this earth. He's very, very smart. I follow him, and I believe everything he said. And when he came out on your show, his solution was, and I quote, his solution was that the solution for this is for Israel to annex Gaza and to kill as many son of bitches as possible to make sure that this will never happen again. And anyone, anyone who will call for a ceasefire will be a terrorist sympathizer. So God forbid, I don't want to be labeled as a terrorist sympathizer. So I agree with Ben Shapiro. I think we should kill as many son of bitches as possible. Well, let me, so okay. Far, but Basim, let me. Uh, three, so far, 3,500 people were killed mm including 5,000 son of bitches in the bombing of the Baptist uh, 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 hospital as we speak right now. Mm -hmm. One third of those 3,500 were children. So my question to Ben Shapiro is, how many more son of bitches mm -hmm. do we need to kill so Ben Shapiro is happy? Okay, because it changes from one year. It changes from one year. I'm sorry. That I, this is it. I'm, I'm, I'm really at a disadvantage here. I'm looking at a camera. I don't see you. I can hear you on my and The ears. reason I'm interrupting so is I think, you might be, I, think, I think you're conflating different interviews with Ben Shapiro. He didn't use the phrase sons of bitches with me. Let me play to you what he actually said he did, on my show. He sh did. He did. Go back, go back to your interview. No, he, he, he didn't. Did. That was another interview. But let me play what he said to me here. Well, I, frankly, I don't believe in proportionate response to terrorism. Stop, I believe that the stop, way that you stop, stop terrorism. Real quick, I don't believe have you noticed response. that Ben Shapiro has disappeared in the like he's not popping off right now because he has yeah. done more damage than good, and they've told him shut the fuck up. Be you think so? Oh, dude, he was making dumb comment, posting dumb shit after, he was dumb, and now he, you don't see him. His own people are like, "Bro, you are going way too hard," and like. This guy is the epitome of internet trolls. Little, tiny, weak bitches, okay, who, are, who act tough and won't fight the fight that he's begging for right now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you say that, but calling him a troll is 
really misrepresents what he is kind of because i mean this is a thought leader i mean there are a lot of people who line up behind this guy no I mean, he's I, a well, real, dude, he, he is a puppet he's a controlled opposition guy it is amazing though how many people like support you know and kind of toe the line with him you know this kind of line up behind him brother well, this was wildly disproportionate well response that doesn't mean in terms of targeting civilians it means in terms of killing as many terrorists as humanly possible and allowing them to dictate the terms of engagement by hiding behind civilians in areas that that they are supposedly responsible for means that the only option for Israel is to surrender to Hamas's hatred of its own citizens, its willingness to use its own children as Stop. human shields. No, I, no. I, it's so funny because history will look so nasty on Ben Shapiro's talking right now because what he's talking about, the narrative is already dying on that. It's already dying. Now, not everyone's going to buy into it because you have these insane human beings who like are are so like uh, it's, this is Ben Shapiro's mask off moment and maybe he's always been this guy but all the credit he earned okay for 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 uh being anti woke is has all just evaporated it's gone even Matt Walsh is asking questions and he's like as Christian as you get and he's like how come nobody's trying to pump the brakes on World War Three. And how come nobody's talking about any? I mean, Matt Walsh is, and we've had, we've discussed yeah, our yeah. opinions on Matt yeah, Walsh. We, we don't always him. agree with him. And Candace Parker, same thing. Candace you know, Parker, Candace Owens, Candace Owens, yeah, is way. I mean, like, I, I mean, I'd love to know what Candace Parker. I don't necessarily of. agree with her on everything, but man, when I I agree with her on most of it, and she's yeah, really she, articulate. She's batting like seventy percent for me. And no, she's batting eighty for, for me. me. I, she got two things wrong for me, but that's fine. And. Like I don't agree with anybody. I don't like. I don't like her approach. Sometimes she's a little. No, cute. I didn't like how she handed the Crowder situation. That was wrong. I, yeah. and that like getting in personal, like talk about his divorce. I feel like you don't need to do that because nobody's perfect. And I just I disagree with her on making of a murder. But that's fine. I mean, those aren't really the worst things ever. Um, but even she's like, whoa, whoa, whoa! Everybody's anti-Semitic now for not wanting World War Three. She's one hundred percent saying that, and I totally agree with her and i think he's i think he's just losing it and he lost all credibility and he's such a tiny tiny man he's a tiny tiny man he he sounds like he has the balls of a teenager like that haven't even dropped what and he you, talks what do you mean he talks smack smack and he's still not in israel fighting yet when ben shapiro and his entire family including his children and i don't like bringing children but he wants you to see here's the problem Johnny. i can do more here that's what he thinks. Yeah, that's exactly what he's going to say. But that doesn't mean anything to me because you need to show us what, how much you're willing to die I can do more here as the head of Israeli propaganda. 100%. Yeah. And I hate bringing people's kids in and uh, I don't want anything bad to happen to anybody's kids. But if you're willing to send everybody's children to die for this cause, your family first. That's my opinion. Your family first. Then, then Country work. You know, so that's my opinion. I just want to get salt guys could ever do that. So now that is significant, substantively different to what you said. He said, right? He's talking there, but, but specifically I agree, I, but, but about I agree with him. I agree. I, I I agree with him. The the thing is, the question is, what is a proportionate response? Because yes. it has been different from one tier to another. So if you look to this graph, for example. This is the death of Israeli and Palestinians, and it's changing from one year to year. It's like fluctuating like crypto. So my question is today, what is the going rate today for human lives? I mean, 2014 was a great year for Ben Shapiro. 88 Israelis were died, and there was 2,329 Palestinians killed on the other side. That is one Israeli for 27 uh, Palestinian. That is a very good exchange rate. What I'm saying is, what is the exchange oh, rate well, for today? Well, I, so I, you Hey guys, real quick, I want to tell you about a couple things you can find on the website, samtriple.com. It's everything you need, audio, video, all there of all my podcasts across the board. You can also get my dates there. You can also get t-shirts there. We are adding t-shirts all the time. We just added a uh, more DSing, less bombing. I love that one, okay? You, we also got uh, Yahweh or the Highway new shirts Woo! are there. They should be up. It's a great way to support the show. Grab your t-shirts now. I got more magic coming. I also have a uh, mental gymnastics one everyone's going to really like. Listen, if you want to support the show, rockfin.com. $15, you get all my shows across all the boards. We also have Cash Daddies, uh, patreon.com slash Cash Daddies. Great way to make money in these difficult markets. 
We also have some affiliates. I'm going to hit them out real quick. Uh, if you're looking for gold and silver, a great way to go to Wise Wolf. Click the banner. Uh, brown Hydrogen brown gas. Everyone loves it. Harley Ray, our good friends in candles and crystals. You can get a, use the promo code SWARM15. Click that one. And Tim James, who was just on the show, universally loved. You can get a discount on all this stuff on his website, Chemical Free Body. And then finally, Joel Staley, who's going to help me lose weight and get ready to rock. All those there, click the banners, support them, support us. It's a great way. And all my audio, all my video, again, right there at samtripoli.com. Enjoy the highlights. And now, a highlight from Cash Daddies. You know, besides Tesla, the stocks that crank today, Verizon who cranked? Is up 4% who cranked? today. Who cranked? That we put out last week. Um, and I had a few patrons ask me about Verizon. I said, yeah. You got to be, you know, it was at 20. I think it was, it, it went down to uh, 2930. That thing is at 3464 right now. It was up three and a half percent today. But more importantly, has almost an 8% dividend yield. 8%. So you buy Verizon, nice. it doesn't move, you still make 8%. Nice. Okay, Caterpillar. I need to get in on this action, dude. Yeah, man, Verizon is... I need to get in on this action, dog. <laughs> Get your money in Verizon. Stays the same, goes up a little, you still make 8%. Doesn't matter, every quarter. Uh, you know, but you got things like Caterpillar, John Deere, 3M. These things were through the roof today. Um, so these are things that I may start looking to buy on dips going forward. Um and they say Bitcoin, the reason Bitcoin is up is because of a lack of liquidity. Not a lot of people, you know, selling it. Good. And that, that's what the big pump was. Give me oh. my Bitcoin back. Yeah, have you heard anything on that? No, I'm supposed to, it's supposed to be done by the end of the year, I thought. There's still a chance, I think. I, I just think it's uh, kind of crawling through. But yeah, what, what's Bitcoin at now? It's at a thirty-four-four. Wow. Ah, oh, jeez, Louise, yes. I'm never gonna get any of my Bitcoin back. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Pumping. It is Give pumping. Thank, thank BlackRock. I'll thank, thank you, BlackRock, we'll for being my daddy. Get it to fifty for me, BlackRock. Let's do it. Thank you, BlackRock, for being my daddy. We, we go deep, homeboy. <laughs> Open your mind. Drink from the fountain of knowledge. There's lizard people everywhere. That's some interdimensional shit. Wake up, Aaron. This is only the beginning. Dude, you just blew my mind. Tim foil hack. Tim foil hack. Tim foil hack.